Well, good evening. Great to have you with us in the room and at home. And as we continue this week with our Bible studies and our prayers. Um, before we do our topic this week, let's pray. Father, we come to you this evening and we pray for the release of your spirit, for the lifting of oppression off hearts and minds, for the breaking of discouragement. Right now, Lord, we pray for those at home, for those who've not made it this evening for whatever reason, Lord, for those that may be feeling under the pressure in the room, those that are feeling under pressure at home, whatever the cause may be, we pray release in Jesus' name. There is no other name under which men must be saved. There is no other name that carries the authority, the absolute authority of God. And so when we call on the name of Jesus, there is no power that can stand against that name. Mm. And so this evening, all heaven declares freedom in Jesus' Jesus name. And this evening, we've moved on again. We we might come back to look at some women. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, in the Bible. In the Bible, yeah. Um, at, a, at a later date, but tonight we, we're going to come back to our previous topic, which was? The Psalms. So tonight we're looking at Psalm 17. <coughs> Hear a just cause, O Lord, attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer, which is not from deceitful lips. Let my vindication come from your presence. Let your eyes look on the things that are upright. You have tested my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me and have found nothing. I have purposed that my mouth shall not transgress. Concerning the works of men, by the word of your lips, I have kept away from the paths of the destroyer. Uphold my steps in your paths, that my footsteps may not slip. I have called upon you, for you will hear me, O God. Incline your ear to me, and hear my speech. Show your marvellous loving kindness by your right hand. O you who save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Mm. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from my deadly enemies who surround me. They have closed up their fat hearts. With their mouths they speak proudly. They have now surrounded us in our steps. They have set their eyes, crouching down to the earth, as a lion is eager to tear his prey, and like a young lion lurking in secret places. Arise, O Lord, confront him, cast him down. Deliver my life from the wicked with your sword, with your hand from men, O Lord, from men of the world who have their portion in this life, and whose belly you fill with your hidden treasure. They are satisfied with children, and leave the rest of their possession for their babes. As for me, I will see your face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. Amen. It's great, isn't it? It's a great psalm. And, um, you know, here's the thing. David's not complaining about his enemies on this one. So he's good. You know, you're a good one with David when he's not having a bad day. Because when we read the Psalms, as we said, you know, David often has a bad day. David yeah. is a, a true and honest reflection of what it is to go through yeah. um, mental health issues to, you know, there's no definite diagnosis. But when you read David, you've got to admit, he does seem pretty bipolar. There is, there is a lot of that going on. One minute he's on the mountaintop and the next minute he's in the valley. Mm. Um, he takes everything to heart. He's very sensitive. He gets upset very easily because... Um, he feels. Yeah. He, he's, he's not perhaps as emotionally stunted as a lot of his peers in that day who would be men of war and violence and yeah. aggression would harden the heart. You know, when you've, when you've had to fight for survival and fight for your family, you draw on the sword, it's easy to lose that sensitivity, yet mm. David keeps it. And I think it's really special. And here we see something of that in the way he prays. And um, here are just cause, O Lord. So what David is saying really is, you know, God, as far as I'm concerned, what I'm asking for you, from you is fair. 
It's honest and it's right. I'm not asking for selfish region, reasons. I'm not asking for um, something that isn't fair to ask for. Um, God, don't let them have that because I want it. Nothing like that. He's actually praying. He's saying, look, my prayers are genuine, God. And I think it's really important for us sometimes to realize when our prayers are genuine, mm -hmm. just how powerful our prayer can be. Yeah. When our prayer is not for the disadvantage or the hurt of others or for the selfish looking after me or mine, that's my family, my mates, if it's mm. not just a selfish prayer. Uh, and David comes, he says, it's not a selfish prayer. I'm, I'm praying honestly, God. I'm praying honestly for genuine reasons. And I think when we do that, it's powerful. Mm. And, and so David comes, he says, give heed to my cry. Now, here's the thing. He will know, David will know from the scriptures that exist at his time. Remember, a lot of the prophets came after David's reign. So a lot of things you read in the prophets, David wouldn't have mm. known as a, a scripture, as a record, but he would still know the faithfulness of God, the promises of God to Abraham and Abraham's yeah. children. So he still knew that to go to God, God would hear his prayer. And yet here he is, he's reinforcing his faith. Yeah. And I think it's really important for us that, that when you read this, you've got to see that why is David saying, oh Lord, hear my cry? When he knows full well that he's promised to Abraham's children, I will hear your cry. Yeah. He, he knows full well from the promise he's made to Moses. You know, when you come to me this way and you do this and when you do that, I will hear you. All these promises that are in uh, the first five books, the Torah, as it were. Mm. Um, so he would have known that God's promise was that God would hear him. Especially when he knows that his just cause, what he's praying for is a right thing. And so why does he say these things? And I think the only conclusion I can come to is he's saying these things because he's reassuring his own belief in the God whom he's calling on. Mm. He say, he's almost like he's saying, Lord, I believe, but I'm just encouraging my belief by saying, Lord, what I'm asking you is right, and I'm asking you to, to hear my prayer because it's, it's a genuine and an honest claim. I, and I think sometimes it's really healthy for us to just stir our faith before we pray. Yeah. Or stir our faith as we begin to pray. Because how often do we pray and we, we know we want what we're asking for and we know it's right to ask for what we're asking for. It's in God's word. So, you know, if you're asking for salvation for somebody, God's word says that God isn't willing that any should perish. So you're just agreeing with God. You're not coming up with something God hasn't already thought of. And, and so the question really is, do we have enough confidence when we ask God? Mm. We might know that God isn't willing that any would perish, but do we have enough confidence that God can speak into the life of the one we're praying for? Yeah. And the truth is that's where the doubt comes in and we start almost denying ourselves our answers to prayer by convincing ourselves of a thousand reasons why not. Well, David just starts with one good reason why. Mm. So God, I'm going to have an answer to my prayer. So as I begin, I'm not going to give myself a thousand reasons why not. I'm just going to give myself one really good reason why. What I'm asking for, it's fair, it's right, it's honest. Hear God, hear my prayer, it's just. Brilliant. And, and I don't suppose you'd think of it like that if you read it just as a psalm. But when you think about the context, what's going on, you realize David is strengthening his confidence. And I wonder how often do we stop and strengthen our confidence when, mm. we, when we're about to pray? We all say for what we're about to receive, but we only pray it sincerely when we're at somebody's house for dinner and we're a bit worried about the, the, the hygiene in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. or, or if we're on an international mission and someone puts something in front of us we've never eaten before and then we really say our prayers. <laughs> but the truth is that, you, you know, sometimes it's good to just take check. Where's my heart? Mm. Am I ready to believe for what I'm praying? Because it, you know, how many people know God called us to be children who walk in miracles? God called us to be children who walk in miracles. Not just children who pray for someone else to have a miracle and then we, we sit there warmly listening to their testimony, but to walk in miracles. So our prayer life needs to move to a whole nother level of trusting God to be like David and praising it. So it's, it's an interesting one, just to step up to a new level and just say, right, I'm going to mm. reinforce my confidence but does David, you know, does David give himself like 10 verses? No, he just says, um, let's start with number one. Yeah. It's a just prayer, God. 
And I think it's also about, um, there's a verse in the Bible that says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, then the Lord will not hear me. Yeah. And he's saying here, look, God, I am being righteous. I'm not regarding sin. I'm not holding anything against anybody. I'm walking in an upright way before you. Goes on even further than that because he says, here's, here's a thought for you. I don't know how, how many people have ever read this and wondered what David's really saying when he says, let my judgment come forth from your presence. Mm. But what he's saying is, you know, if I've come to you um, and I've regarded anything that I shouldn't have in my heart, if I've got an issue against somebody, if I've done something and I'm not aware of it. Mm. So this isn't about the things I know I should put right. This is about the things I don't know. And David says, well, Lord, you judge me. From yeah. your presence, you check me out. Because what that tells me is this. This is a man who isn't, a f he, he's got a healthy respect. They call it the fear of the Lord. He's got a healthy respect for God. He won't play games with God. But he's not afraid of God. Mm. And that's what, for us, it puts into context this idea of the fear of the Lord. So we talk about the fear of the Lord and we think it's like, oh, should I be terrified of God? Well, no. Am I terrified of electricity? No. But I have a very healthy respect for it. You won't see me swinging from two 240 volt electric wires that aren't, you know, that have been stripped bare and then saying, go on, switch it on now, switch it on now. Because I'm not a light bulb, it won't give me a buzz. <laughs> But, but like this, this process that David's talking about in these verses, that's like when we come to the communion table. Yeah. And yet how often do we come in that same attitude and spirit before we pray and we put ourselves right? Yeah, God judge me. Yeah. God judge me. I'm trusting your judgments that if, it, if I'm not in the right place for this prayer to be heard, I'm, I'm under your yeah. judgment. And to submit to God's judgment is to say, well, God, come and adjust me. Yeah. Come and adjust my character. Come and adjust my attitude because what I'm praying for is more important than how I feel about myself. Yeah. That's huge, isn't it? Ooh, when you think like that, you know, is the salvation of my family more important than how I feel about myself? You bet it is. Yeah. If I'm going to ask God for my children to be saved, you know, I've got to go to God and say, God, I, hey, you know, I, often I've got to go and I've just got to say, God, I'm not perfect. I don't need you to judge. I can give you a list. But God, I might have missed one, so you judge me as well. <laughs> and it's that, isn't it, that being open before God in our praying and in our seeking that we come and we say, okay, God, here I am. And hear my openness to you. Hear my heart. Hear my cry. Hear what I'm asking for. It's great for us. Mm. And uh, it, he goes on, doesn't it? You know, let your eyes look with equity is the phrase I've got in my translation. Mm -hmm. I'm using a different translation to you. Yeah. What's your translation say? Um, let your eyes look on the things that are upright. Upright. Mm. So equity really is fairness, isn't it? She's kind of saying, you know, well, God, look at me like you look at everybody else. It's almost like saying no special favours, even though David was a man after God's heart. God, no special favours, just... You, you weigh me, you check me out, and then I know that there is absolutely no reason why you will not give me the answer mm. to my prayer. Does that make sense? It's like, God, there, there is no boundaries, no hurdles, no obstacles. So all I can do is believe that having done all that, I have what I asked for. Okay? So here's the deal, if we can grasp that, our neighbours, our families, our friends are already sitting here with us. Mm. Because the Bible trades in the currency of faith. And the truth is that much of what we ask for, we don't receive. I mean, James tells us, you know, you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss. Mm. That's when we're asking selfish, selfishly. Yeah. But when we're asking in an upright way, like David, he comes mm. and he checks his heart and he says, God, my heart's before you and you can just measure it. You can judge me and you can weigh this up. He's got no reason to doubt. So what David's doing in the way he's approaching God, he's removing every doubt barrier that might get in the way of his faith. He's defeating 
the opposition to his faith with his confidence in God at every step. So that by the time he asks his petition of God, mm. he has it. And for us, it's, it's just what, what we're saying in effect, to put it in short, is David is confidence building. The way he talks is the way he talks. What he's doing is confidence building because he is saying, God, here's my heart. I'm open. I'm honest before you. And I'm putting myself under your trust. All I ask is deal with me fairly. He knows God is fair. So again, he's just reminding himself God is fair. All the things he's asking of God, he already knows God yeah. is. So he's not asking God because God might not be. He's just reinforcing his own confidence in God. And by doing that, he's kind of really, I won't say psyching himself up, that would be a wrong, mm. but he's, he's almost pulling down every opposition in his own mind yeah. to the reasons why he wouldn't have this. Do, have you ever done this? Anybody ever done this? You, you know, you're praying for something and then you find your heart, your mind start convincing you of reasons why not. Happens all the time. It's the human condition. It's not something that happens to just a person. We all suffer the same thing. That we're praying and we're trusting, and what happens is there's a thousand reasons start coming into our mind. The enemy starts whispering, Oh, you can't have that because you're not this. Or you can't have that because uh, that isn't in place. You can't have that. And suddenly what happens is we talk ourselves out of the thing that our faith would work miracles in. And so David's showing us here, I just take down the obstacles mm. before I begin. In the way I prepare my heart for prayer, even in the way I approach. Jesus kind of did it in a different way when Jesus says, when you pray, pray like this. Our Father, who is in heaven, holy and to be reverenced is your name. And what he's saying is, you know, remind yourself who God is. Remind yourself of the authority God carries. Remind yourself of who it is you're going to with your prayers. And it's this, it's this same principle we see here. Different words, different context slightly, but the same principle. You build your position of confidence in him yeah. through removing the, any area of doubt. Uh, it's a brilliant step that we, we, you know, when we talk about prayer, we talk about having faith. But how often do we mm. talk about removing the obstacles to our faith? And that's exactly what David said. Yeah. I think it's brilliant. Brilliant. And, well, there we are. I don't know, maybe I'm reading, reading a different Bible to everybody else, but that's what I read. <laughs> and then he, he says the next thing here then. So, so remember what he's just asked. Mm. Yeah. I submit myself to your judgment. Yeah. From your presence. Judge me from your presence is what he's just said. And in the next verse, he says, you have tried my heart. So he's asking him, but in the next breath, he's already saying, but of course I know you already have. I've been on this journey with you, God. I've been chased by someone I love and respect who has made my life a misery and hunted me like a criminal. And every time I try and serve him, he throws spears at me. And I don't know why he hates me, but he does. But you've saved me and you've provided for me. And I've been through this journey where you've been building my character and developing my leadership skills and you've been challenging the um, difficult areas of my attitude and life so that I can become the man you want me to be. Because the truth is, David is in training for leadership all the time. He's mm. in exile. Everything he goes through, he's leading difficult people. Remember when you're, I'm going off track here, but when you're leading rebels and criminals, they're not easy people to lead. <laughs> Because they're full of rebellion, they're full of trouble, they're difficult. But David, all the time, he's learning. If, 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 if he can lead and inspire these people, then he can lead a nation easy. Because these are, the, these are the difficult ones. And so when he's talking to God and he says, oh, you have tried my heart. He's not only talking from the answer to his prayer, but he's also talking from the understanding of his life experience. God, you've already brought me this thought, and I know that you've already worked in my heart. And if there's an issue, I know you'll come and tell me. Yeah. So, so I, I'm ready. I'm, I'm good for this. It's great, isn't it? You've tried my heart. You have visited me by night. Ooh. What do you think? Do you think he's talking about a personal visitation of the Holy Spirit? Or do you think he's being reflective? Well, it could be both. 
I mean, how often do we experience God in the middle of the night when he wakes us up to talk to us? Often our days are so busy and our lives are so full of stuff going on that it's at night God has to wake us up to talk to us because that's the only time we're quiet. It's very possible. Because when you think, I mean, you know, David will have spent days where he's just running. Mm. Days where he's in a foreign embassy, as it were. He's gone to another king to dwell in his land and he, he's having to watch his back and his every word mm. every minute of the day because, you know, he, he's a son of the enemy. He's, yeah. he's still a Jew, even though he's in an enemy king's kingdom because it's the only place he can find safety from Saul. And you have to read Kings and Chronicles to, to learn about yeah. all that journey. But when you look at it, I've no doubt that God's come and he's visited David at times. And mm. David's cried in the day and God's come at night and whispered in his ear and said, yeah. you know, be still. David, I love you. David, what I promised you is going to come to pass. Mm. What the prophet prayed over you is still my plan for your life. And, uh, yeah, you know, you see it like that. And then he says, you've tested me and you find nothing. That's a confident comment. Yeah. Very. Do you think you could say that of God? You've tested me and you find nothing? You've tested me and I'm ready to work on it. <laughs> <laughs> that may be more like it sometimes. But David, what a confidence to be able to say, you've tested me and you found nothing. Mm. What's he saying? Is he saying, God, I haven't got a bit of an attitude at times? Is he saying, God, you know, I'm not a womanizer? Now, we know that's not true because when he becomes king, look at the size of his harem. And he still has to have a married man's wife. And, and it's all in the Bible. And David was not perfect. He had his flaws. But, but when he says this, mm. he's not talking about his faults. He's talking about the genuineness of his heart. He's not talking about, is he a perfect person? No. He's saying, God, you've tried me. There's genuineness here. There's, there's no mm. false agendas or, or hidden issues. God, it, it is what it is. This is my heart and it's true. I think he's probably a man that walks in repentance as well. Well, that's a huge secret, isn't it? To yeah. walk in repentance. It's not that we just embrace our imperfections and say, it's okay, I'm not perfect. We deal with them. David was yeah. a man who dealt with his imperfections. We know that. Um, huh. I have purposed. This is a big one. Mm. I have purposed that my mouth will not transgress. Mm. That is tough. Yeah. James says, if anyone is able to bridle the tongue, he is a mm. perfect man. David says, I have decided that when I speak, it's going to be right. That's not an easy thing for anybody because as Jesus taught, what comes out of our mouth is what's in our hearts. Yeah. If our hearts aren't right, no matter how careful we are with our lips, something's going to come out somewhere. And, and I think it's a tell, isn't it? You know, and it doesn't, we don't say that by means of condemnation to anybody who's watching tonight. It's just the reality that we don't hide the truth of our nature, but we choose to work mm. to change our nature, to become yeah. more Christ-like, to become like David in his approach to God, that he could come and say, mm. I've decided I'm not going to say things that are going to cause me. Mm. And I think, I think often as Christians, like we're very aware of um, not stealing and not doing things wrong in that sense. Um, but often we're not so aware of not saying things wrong and not thinking things wrong that then come out in our words. Peter wanted to look after Jesus yeah. and Jesus accused him of being the devil. Mm that's what was going on. Jesus told Peter that he was going to have to die. Peter said, absolutely not, Lord. And Jesus' response is, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God. Mm. Peter was very genuine in what he said. Yeah. But his words for Jesus were clearly a temptation meant to pull down the purpose of the kingdom of heaven. You know, to be that sensitive and walking that way, wow, well, that's just something to, for us all to aspire to, isn't it? And poor Peter. Poor Peter, yeah. <laughs> I love Peter because he, not, only, not only did he jump in at the deep end and get all the great experiences, but he took it on the chin when he, he got did, it wrong as well. Yeah, Fair play to him. He took it on the chin. You know, and if it had been anybody else, they'd have got out of the boat and said, you know what, Jesus? I'm going home. Yeah, find another <laughs> disciple. 
It's true, isn't it? <laughs> I have kept from the paths of the violent. Mm. Do you know, it's funny, in, in the first account of the destruction of humanity, talking about Noah. Yeah. It wasn't for their sexual immorality. It wasn't for their greed. It was for their violence that God destroyed the earth. Because when you read the account, it says, mm. and the thoughts and intents of man were evil, and there was violence on the earth all day long. And, and it's that understanding that violence is something that God disdains. Mm. It's a bit like when you have children at home, and one of them gets really angry and starts laying into the other. While it's words, you might kind of just, oh, you, come on, stop that. But the minute it turns out to be, you know, ands and straight in there and pull them apart because you don't want your children hurting each other but you don't if you love them how does God feel and then Jesus says I'm not just looking at what you do with your hands and feet I'm looking at what you do with your heart remember listening to Steve Hill preach this was really tough stuff Steve Hill in the Pensacola um outpouring um, and he preached some really hard truths and honest but true and he said this he said how many commit murder in their hearts yeah. and in their minds yeah. because they look at another person another woman or another man and they instantly think well if only my my spouse wasn't here mm. murder in your heart if only my partner wasn't here so I could go with that person and Steve Hill will put it exactly as it was. And ooh, you just then shivers up your spine listening to you preach. And he's like, you've as good as committed murder in your heart mm. because you're wishing that person that God's gifted you into your life, you're wishing them away. Um, and all that comes into this context of violence. And if you're watching tonight and that's hard, well, the Lord bless you and give you strength to hear it and accept it. But God challenges us to put away malice and violence from our hearts towards mm. one another. This country has a huge record for violent thinking. And one of the worst catalysts is a big round circle in a big metal box. But, I mean, how often do you ah! hear, hear parents getting frustrated with their children, children and some oh. of the things they say? And, and like, not for one minute would they actually do those things, but they don't think twice to say them. But in the hearts. Yeah. And, and like I say, road rage. Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness me, the most mild-mannered and pleasant of people. They become, they become the devil himself behind the wheel of a car. Um, and, and, just, uh, and at the end of the day, it's all there. And David says, you know what? I can honestly say, I've kept myself from that kind yeah. of attitude. Uh, and good for David that he can say that. Um, I think for us, it's really difficult because often you have Christians who are naturally meek. Mm. So they're not people who get upset and angry. But the truth is, a lot of Christians, they have temperament. And they get angry about things. And oh, well, we've got to guard our hearts and our minds from slipping, letting that anger slip into those places. And David says, that's what I've done. I've, I, I've, just, I've locked that down so I haven't gone there. Yeah. Um, uh, well, I mean, when you think about, you know, the time he tore, sneaked up behind Saul and cut a piece of his garment and then stood on the mountain and said, excuse me, who's your bodyguard? You better have a word with him. Mm. He says, That's the words he says. He said, you better have a word with your bodyguard. I love you enough not to kill you. Who loves you enough to protect you? Uh, and, and so he just, so even then he's showing his integrity. I'm not a man of violence. Mm. And yet, he was. God says you're not going to build the temple because you're a man who's drawn the sword. Mm. But in his heart, he says, I'm not a man of violence. In other words, I did it, but I didn't love doing it. You think about that. To be a man of violence, because he was a soldier, he was a warrior, in a time when the only way to survive was to fight. And yet, he can say, I've kept my heart from violence. Mm. This is an interesting idea, isn't it? You know, that he could be a warrior, and yet say, I've kept my heart from violence. It's an interesting one. And God didn't accuse him of having a violent attitude or a violent heart when he said, I'm not going to let you build the temple, but your son's going to build it in your stead. Solomon built the temple that David had planned. But what God said is, you have blood on your hands. Yeah. So even there we see the evidence that what David's saying is true. It's not a boast. It's 
It's just what you do. It's, it's interesting, isn't it? You think of it like that. My steps have held fast to your paths. Oh, most Christians feel like they're walking a tightrope. <laughs> paths? Paths? I, I love a paving stone to walk on, God. I, I don't know about you, but most Christians I talk to at some point in their lives, they think, where did the path go? I feel like I'm walking on a tightrope here. Any, anything I do, I feel like I'm going to fall off my, my confidence in God. And COVID was a huge one for that. The number of Christians who suddenly, where did the path go? You know, get me a balancing pole. I think, I think I'm going to fall off here. Um, and David said, you know, I've, I, I've, I've kept, I've kept your paths. Mm. In fact, he says, I have held fast, which is a great picture, isn't it? You know, what do we do to keep our walk with Jesus? We hold on for all we're worth. When it gets worse, we cling. Yeah, it's a bit like being in a storm and you're on a rock. And the more the waves beat and the rain powers down, the tighter you hold on. Mm. That's the only, that's the only, I, I can't give you a better picture tonight of what it is to walk through hard times and places with God is sometimes you just have to dig your fingers in and hold on for all your worth until you come mm. through that moment and out the other side and you can say, I did it. I held on. I held on for all I was worth. Why does God allow us to go through things like that? Because it is confidence building and character building. Because when we look back, we often think, I held on for all I was worth. And then we look back and realize we were clinging on for desperation and God has arms right round us all the time. <laughs> and God said, yeah, you thought you were holding on to me, but actually, look behind you. Look how big the arms were that were holding you. Um, but at the time, our experience is one where we can't see the arms behind us. We're too busy looking at God in front of us and trying to hold on for all we're worth. But David says, hey, I held tight to your paths, and my feet have not slipped. I have called upon you, for you will answer mm. me, O oh God. And then he says it again. Turn your ear to me. Hear, hear what I'm saying. It's this really interesting way he keeps reinforcing his right to come to God and pray. Yeah. The other thing is this. For David, righteousness is not a given. You might not realize that tonight. As believers, though you might not think it, righteousness is a given. Yeah. Because it's grace. It's given. Jesus Christ gave you righteousness when he died for your sin. He became your sin on the cross. He paid your price. And when we accept that, we have righteousness. We don't need to come. I slipped up this week. Here's five doves and a couple of goats. Uh, I had a really bad domestic this week. Here's ten sheep. You know, um, it's not like that. But for David, it was. You took sacrifices mm. to atone for your sins so that you could be ceremonially righteous before God. So for David, he doesn't stand in righteousness like we might stand in righteousness. Mm. So his words are the words of a man who is reassuring himself of his right standing with God. I think that's good for us as well, that we re reassure ourselves. I love this next phrase. What does yours put it like? Wondrously show your loving kindness. And mine is, show your marvellous loving kindness. Yeah. It's not quite the same as when your children come up to you and say, if you love me. <laughs> when you stood in the sweet shop or the toy shop or the supermarket or wherever you stood. And the kids go, uh, can I have one of them? No, you don't love me. <laughs> All children do it at some point. <laughs> it's not that. It's quite the opposite. David's saying, you know, you love me so much. It's amazing that you love me in the way that you do. And remember, he doesn't know Jesus. David's going to be a prophet king. Mm. And, and, and so I love what David says. He's prophetic. But, but he just turns out of it. It's wonderful loving kindness. And Oh, saviour of those who take refuge 
at your right hand. Mm. Who's on Jesus' left hand? Yeah, do you, do you want me to, you know, <laughs> okay, left and right. Yeah. <laughs> I have to go on like this. <laughs> and I only learned that recently. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not going to tell him. I used to think you were a real <laughs> stylistic fashionista until I realised the only reason you didn't buy lace-up shoes is because you couldn't tell. <laughs> I went I'm the wrong way kidding. on the driving I'm test. Don't um, worry. <laughs> so Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father on high. It's just a, it's a referential thing. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, I, I'm not sure that in heaven there is a left and a right to God in that way because God's everywhere. So it's not quite the same. It's a... A, a relational thing for human beings to see rather than a physical reality in the heavenlies. Maybe it is a physical reality in the heavenlies. No one's come back from heaven to tell us that one yet. Mm. But, I, th I think this right hand talk, because it, it says it earlier on about, um, I think it talks about authority mm -hmm. and honour. Yeah. Um, I think if we looked into it, into Jewish tradition and so on, you'd probably find... There's, there's a definite distinction between a left hand and a right oh, hand. Oh, definitely. So I mean, the right hand is way. the right hand. Yeah. So, in, in in most cultures, the right hand is the first place of honour. So, the person on your right is always more honoured honoured than the person on your left, even mm. though they're both next to you. So, so, the person on your right is that's where we get this idea of our right hand man. Yeah. The person who is first in our delegated authority and all that. So there is that to it, yeah. for sure. Um, but it's also this. What really struck me as I was reading this, it was not only that's a brilliant thought, but it's this, a saviour of those who take refuge at your right hand. Mm. Do you know, such, you know, we could just preach a message on that, couldn't we? We just spend the rest of the night on that. The idea of the saviour of those who take refuge in the place of God's favour. Mm. Mm. the saviour of those who take refuge for God in the place of his preferential delegated authority mm. it's a bit powerful isn't it we could go on you, you could just when you think about what that position is and David's saying hey and in that place where we think of favour, honour, authority you know empowerment all those things acceptance the rest of it you know, go through it all. David says, that's where those who take refuge in you sit. Mm. Whereas normally when you're running to somebody to take refuge, you, you, you might run behind them. But no, th they go to the place of honour mm. to take refuge. There's a great biblical picture of the relationship of heaven. But it's this idea then, what I saw is this. So, you go and take refuge at the right hand of him who is your saviour while he protects you from those who were your enemies. Yeah? Yeah. Well, it's, what, what, I got this beautiful picture when I was reading this. If there we are, and Jesus is like this, they're mine, you can stay away. And it was like, actually, I don't have any enemies because Jesus is standing in between me and anybody who would be my enemy. All I can do is do what Jesus asks. Mm. So all I see my enemies is through Jesus. Does that make sense? So even people I would think of as enemies because they do something I don't like or whatever else. And we, enemies are often a strong word when we're trying to contextualize it in modern relationships. But... You know, if someone's against me in some way or doesn't like something in some way, the truth is, I've got to see them through Jesus. I've got to go and stand right at his side while he goes, hey, no. So I see them through Jesus, which means I see them through the eyes of grace because they can't touch me because they've got to go through him to reach me anyway. So I'm in the perfect place of safety. Just whatever we talk about, standing with Jesus as our saviour, as protector. That, that's how I get it. Well, I think sometimes it's more a case of his arm is round in a hug and holding the enemies at bay, isn't it? 
Yeah, I wouldn't want, I want, I want his, his arm up that high. I'd feel like I was in an headlock, but yeah. <laughs> well, it depends how tall Jesus is. I, I don't mind it. If Jesus wants me in a headlock, that's good enough. <laughs> to be that close, yeah. Do you think John had an headlock when he was... You never know. You know, if they were having a bit of banter, I'd, oh, no, don't, don't get upset. We want to get a reverent now. But do you think, you know, when Jesus was laying on, when, when John was laying on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper, do you think he gave him a nuggie? <laughs> you all right, boy? <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing in the Bible about that. I'm just teasing. You can scrub that from your recording. <laughs> but let's not kid ourselves. We're talking about real people. Yeah. Who lived and had laughs and jokes and, you know, who laughed and cried together. They were real people. They weren't, you know, these super holy, <laughs> pious, you know, dressed in grey. Mm. Special Bibles, they were all in grey as well. Special makeup, it was grey. Special hair dye, it was grey. They invented Greece in 2000, but the guy who copied the ingredients, he got it wrong and started dyeing people's hair black instead of grey. Mm-hmm. They weren't miserable, dour, boring people. They were living human beings yeah. who, who ha- had their own experiences, just like David. But David, he just brings us, he's really important to bring us back on track so I don't lose the plot. He, he just brings us this beautiful picture of how we don't have enemies. Mm. We don't have enemies. And if people want to make themselves enemies against us, then it's Jesus they've got to talk to. Mm. And I feel very sorry for them. If people would pray against us and practice all sorts of wrong things to try and pull us down, I feel sorry for them. Because I know who my God is. Yeah. I know what he's capable of. And I fear for them because of that. So, sad, isn't it? And then we come on, oh. yeah. See, if, if, I, if I wasn't wired to a mic, I, I'd, I'd, I'd get up and dance around for this one. I'll, I'll ask someone at the back of the room to dance around for me. You ready? <laughs> okay. You're going to dance around for me at the back of the room? You ready? Keep me as the apple of your eye. <laughs> That's awesome, isn't it? So he's, he's reinforced all his faith. He's, he's gone through all this process of reassuring himself and his confidence. But one of his big requests is, just keep me as the apple of your eye. Love me and dote on me, God. If David knew what we knew, Mm. he wouldn't just have a smile. He'd have to turn the lights off when he came in the room because he'd be beaming that much. When you read his highs with God, imagine what he felt like if he'd have met Jesus in person. He would have not had another day in the valley experience. Prophetically, he gives us some of the most remarkable visions Mm. of Jesus the Christ. In the Psalms, because David doesn't have a prophetic book, but in his Psalms, there's much prophetic. Yeah. And in most of that comes from David. David was very prophetic. And in his prophetic, he tells us all about Jesus. Um, and yet here he is. Dad, <laughs> just love me. It's great, isn't it? Keep, here's the apple of your eye. And here is, you want to make it prophetic? He's saying that about himself. Do you think he's prophesying that about Jesus? I have this beautiful picture. I'm going way off the subject now. Jesus walking on the water. The disciples are miles away. No one's watching Jesus. This isn't done for anybody to go, wow. It won't be till he gets near the boat that Peter says, if it's you, tell me to come out on the water. Mm. Yeah? And they were already quite a distance. So all the distance Jesus walked in the twilight where they couldn't see him, what's going on? You're walking on water to get to them. What's going on? We don't even know if he was actually walking on water. God might have just picked him up by his angels and planted him on the water just out of the disciples' sight. But the scripture says he came to them walking on the water. So we assume he was walking all the way. And, and my, just one of the love revelations I have in the Holy Spirit of this is Jesus walking along and he's not looking at the water with a big small grin on his face and he's not walking along, you know, like all, you know, on he nomine patria. He, he's not doing any of that. I am convinced Jesus is walking on the water and he's going, I love you, Dad. I'm convinced. Whenever Jesus was on his own, the first thing he was saying is, I love you, Dad. Mm. 
Because every time you hear of a prayer that Jesus utters, the first thing he says is, Father. It's great. And so I'm convinced when he's walking on the water and there's no one else around, he's going, I love you, Dad. And I bet all the way he's walking, all he can hear back is, I love you too, son, apple of my eye. It's great. You know, to us it sounds all mushy and pathetic because we're so hard-hearted, sin-soaked, wicked people in this generation. But for Jesus, it was just quality. I love you, Dad. Mm. It's brilliant recently. It's taken me 50 odd years to be man enough to tell my dad that I love him. Because we're tough people. And you don't talk like that because that's sissy and pathetic. Because that's who we am. That's how I grew up. But some things need saying. Mm. And I felt so, so happy to be able to say that rather than look at the fact that I might never have said it at all. And then I look at what God's like and what God's like with his children. And now David says, keep me as the apple of your eye. Mm. And I think, I, I, I get it. I get it. It's not, do you love me, God? It's just, keep me in that place where yeah. you can love me that much. Keep me in the place <laughs> Keep me as the apple of your eye. Keep me in a place where I don't embarrass you so much with my sinfulness, you have to look away. That's kind of what he's saying. Because God cannot regard sin. Scripture says God cannot look on sin. Mm -hmm. Why, when Jesus became sin for us, the Lord turned away and Jesus uttered those words, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God hadn't forsaken him, but Jesus had the sense of God looking away for the first time ever in his existence. That must have been a most horrendous shock. And so David saying, keep me. Mm. Don't let me fall into a place where you can't look at me, God. Where you're ashamed when I come to pray because it's like, they're going to repent of that first. They're going to sort that out first. You know, keep me, God. What a, what a statement to make. Keep me as the apple of your eye. Mm. Hide me in the shadow of your wings. Yeah. Greatest ministries I've ever seen have all been hidden. And I'm not talking about they're not there for you to see. It's been my privilege, our privilege over the years to meet some quite prominent international people. We've had some here speaking to us. Um, some quite interesting characters we've had here, like the Jellyfish Man and others. And I've noticed a difference, something that we all ought to aspire to, I suppose. There are those that you cannot miss because of how big their personality is. And there are those you cannot miss because of how big God is. And it's not that they don't have a big personality, but they have hidden themselves in the shadow of his wing. God, don't let them see me. Mm. When I'm stood there, don't let them see me. Let them see you. Yeah. When I'm going to speak to someone and tell them about you, when I'm going to my neighbors, don't let them see me. Let them see you. And that's born out of an honest reality in our own perspective of mm. ourselves. And when I say honest, there's a difference between being self-destructive, I'm worthless, I can't do anything, and being humble, God hide me. There's a difference between humility and self-defeat. Self-defeat will make me do wrong things without realizing it. But when I'm hidden, and all that God would hide us all, so that when people see us, they don't see us, they mm. see Jesus. It's just, it's a great thought, isn't it? Mm. Hide me under the shadow of your wings. And then he, he, he takes it further, because he's not just hide me under the shadow of your wings, keep me from their sight. But it's 
Keep me from the wicked who despoil me. There's a sermon there as well. Mm. Bad company breeds bad habits. It doesn't matter how good your intentions. They gave Jesus a hard time because he spent all his time with people who were considered to be socially undesirable. Mm. The dregs of society. They're tax collectors, they're sinners, they're prostitutes. That's disgusting. You, you shouldn't be with that. that. And, and, and as for the lepers, as far as Jewish society when Jesus was on the earth, social scum, a lot of them. We don't mix with the like of them. Get them out of here. And yet what Jesus did, he turned it all on its right perspective, I would say. Others would say he turned the world upside down. I'd say he turned the world the right way up. And he mm. said this, in their hearts, they're desperately in need of someone to help them. In your heart, you're just full of hatred. And he showed the, the Pharisees up all the time. It's like, you know, you're supposed to be the righteous, but you're full of hatred. You're supposed to be the good, but you're full of judgment. You're full of criticism. And all the time, Jesus is talking about the Pharisees. That's what he keeps saying is, your hearts are full of horridness. Mm -hmm. And yet you go around telling everybody you're the right ones. And I've come for the sick because they need someone to help them. And that was Jesus' heart. I've come to help those who need help. Not those who refuse help because they refuse to admit mm. that they're wrong. Massive. And David says, you hide me so that I don't go sour with the sour. And I don't turn rotten with the rotten. And I don't become critical and hard-hearted with the critical and hard. <laughs> He's saying, you shield me, God, so that my nature, my character, the walk I have with you that we've just read through all the, you know, you've judged me and you found me okay mm. and I've kept hold of my path and I've done all this. God, you shield me so that the wicked don't spoil me. Mm. What he's saying is, I realize if I keep company with them, then something of what they do will rub off on me and I won't be the man I want to be with you. That's huge. There's a whole message there just in that. But that's what he's saying. You know, keep me from the wicked who despoil me, my deadly enemies who surround me. Mm. They have closed their unfeeling heart. There you go, cold, hard. With their mouths they speak proudly. They have surrounded us in our steps. They set their eyes to cast us down to the ground. He is like a lion eager to tear, and as a young lion lurking in hiding places, Arise, Lord, mm. confront him, bring him low. He doesn't say, destroy him. Mm. He doesn't say, blot him out. Because he's looking at him, his enemy, through his saviour. Mm. And he doesn't say, help me to beat him. No. He say, God, you God? do it. I've asked you to yeah. judge me rightly. Now you judge that one rightly as well. Deal with him rightly, Lord. You deal with him. Bring him low. Bring him to his senses. Deal with him. Even in his prayers against those that he feels uh, have set themselves up against him, he, he's very gracious in how he prays. Mm. I think it's powerful. Learn a lot from David like that. From men with your hand, O Lord. Huh. From men of the world whose portion is in... This is a really interesting one. We're coming to a close. We're uh, nearly there. Um, <laughs> From men of the world whose portion is in this life and whose belly you fill with your treasure. Mm. Yeah, he's acknowledging that God takes care of everybody. Good or bad, God loves us all. And what the world enjoys, think of it like this, the richest people on earth God gave them that yeah it's easy to think sometimes the world looks after its own it's the old proverb isn't it all the world looks after its own but what David is saying is God gives them that mm. uh, do you know there's something really interesting there when you think of it like that that everybody has their portion from God yeah when we go to judgment everybody will have to explain themselves to God because they'll stand before God and, and God will say, well, did you ever lack for food? And mm. they'll go, no. 
Did you ever lack for clothes? <laughs> no. Did you have the best of everything? Yes. Did you live in a great house? Yes. Did you have a very beautiful wife? Yes. Did you have a very prominent social position? Yes. Did everybody respect you and revere? Yes. Then why didn't you honor me? Um. Uh. And so David's right when he says, even what those who don't honor God have, has been given by yeah. God's benevolence. We all breathe the same air because God lets us breathe. It's the truth. And I think when we see the world like that, it changes the context and the, the thoughts we have in everything, doesn't it? It's all God-given. Doesn't mean to say if you ask him for a million pounds, you'd give it. Mm -hmm. He even talks about those who have legacy in the world. Mm. But he says this, he finishes on this thought, as for me, I shall see your face in righteousness. Mm. I will be satisfied with your likeness when I awake. Mm. Is he talking about how good he feels when he wakes up in the morning? Possibly. Is he talking about when he lays to rest and he sleeps before he rises in the resurrection? Possibly. Both are applicable when you're talking about David in a psalm like this. But it's this beautiful thought that David is saying the thing that he most values, the thing he's most looking forward to, his greatest treasure, is to see God face to face. Yeah. And I suppose that's why not only are there psalms in the Bible, but why David was called a man after God's own mm. heart. Because I don't believe for one minute there's anything false in what David says. When David says, my reward will not be wealth, legacy, children, huge bank portfolios and property portfolios. My legacy will be to see yeah. your face. That's powerful. From a man who would end up having a very powerful and wealthy position, mm. but he's not looking for it. He's looking just for God, yeah. just to know God. And he starts by reinforcing and encouraging himself in his prayers to God, and he finishes by reinforcing his heart that whilst he sees others going after the things of this world, he reinforces to himself and to God what he's after mm -hmm. is a God encounter that will yeah. last forever. It's a brilliant thought. That's all we've got time for this week. I love David and his psalms. He's very good. And there's, there's so much more we could have brought out of this, but probably not the time tonight to tease it out any further. Mm. And, and probably a dozen sermons in there without even trying. <laughs> um, so much. When David writes, it is, the word we might use, it's pregnant with prophetic yeah. power. There's such a rich, rich revelation in his words that sometimes you have to marvel that a man who lived in the generation he did had such insight into the nature of God's salvation and the nature of God's righteousness. It's tremendous stuff. But that's it. That's all we've got time for this week. It's been great to have you with us. And right now, we're just going to ask Carrie to pray because she's been very quiet all evening. <laughs> you only had two penneth worth. I'll, I'll, I'll get you a big bag of coins and you can have a four penneth worth next week. Are you going to make room for that? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, Father, we just thank you for this time we've been able to spend together studying your word. Lord, we thank you that, like David, we can say we are the apple of your eye. Mm. And Lord, I pray that you will hold us in that truth as we go through the rest of this week. Lord, let it fill our hearts with your assurance and with your confidence that you are in control of all things and that your thoughts towards us are thoughts of goodness and blessing. Lord, we just thank you for your goodness and your loving kindness and your mercy. And Lord, I pray that we will be amazed by your marvellous loving kindness this week. In yeah. your name I ask it. Amen. Amen. We'll see you soon. <laughs>